I V M. Hi, I'm Rohan Joshi, and on my podcast, the show about crypto, I've been having some pretty cool conversations with industry experts about what exactly cryptocurrency is and what makes it so exciting. If you haven't already, please check it out on the IVM Podcasts Network. Now, a quick shout out to my fellow crypto heads. We've got a listener survey going on, which will take not more than ten minutes of your time to fill out. So please check the link in the description and help me out by filling it up. Don't forget to tune into a show about crypto on the IVM app and wherever you get your podcasts from. So Rodis was already being done by MTV, and they said that guys, can you apply reality to dating instead of to what they already do in Rodis, which is uh, you know daring the young people to you know to do all sorts of things that you do in that whole universe, and that was our next big one. So we came up with that idea. I remember in that cubicle you know, when uh, between me and Rajiv, we said we looked at each other. I said, "Shucks, I don't know where is this going to lead us." And indeed, today if you see, I think it's what. Eight seasons, and uh, you know, Sunny Leone, I think, is the anchor. The last I looked at it, and yeah. it's been a long journey, you know. So, Splits Villa became the next one, and then with the kind of success it had, then we took over Rodies, and then we ended up shooting Rodies almost in every. We exhausted the whole continents as to where all Rodies went. You know, it went to Australia, South Africa. I think China also was one of the places where we shot it. So, Rodies took on its own journey. Splits Villa became a, a sort of self-sustaining universe, so to speak, and these are still big properties that power MTV. You know. Hello and welcome to the Filter Coffee Podcast. Ajit Andare is the Chief Operating Officer of Ycom 18 Studios, and in my mind, someone with one of the most interesting IMDb pages ever. As a studio head, he is greenlit some of the most genre-defying list of content, ranging from Padmavat to Andadun to Toilet Ek Prem Katha and Drishyam. We often talk about following our heart in our careers, and I always felt that phrase was a lot of hyperbole. But then there is Ajit, who is an engineer who spent a decade at Hindustan Unilever, running a poultry feed business and reconfiguring tea packing machines, and much more. Then he would follow his heart and jump headfirst to start a production house, the now famed Colosseum Media, that would produce some of the biggest shows in the country, from Master Chef to Rodies to Splits Villa. I spoke to Ajit about career decisions and also about convictions, how films like Andha Dun. Look on paper, and how he is able to see the films that they can become. Stay with us. We'll be right back on the Filter Coffee Podcast. Hey, everybody! It's been another great week on the IVM Podcast Network. On Cyrus says, "Good friend of the show, good friend of Cyrus and myself, Mangalam Malu is on." He's the assistant editor and anchor at CNBC TV 18, and he and Cyrus discuss how the budget of 2022 affects us all. On this round is on me. We flip the script as Gauri is a guest on her own show. Check it out as Kavita Rajwari, my co-founder at IBM Podcast, hosts this very special episode. On misconduct, Ragvi and Nisha are joined by Priya Mirza. She's the host of the Longest Constitution podcast. They take a close look at the former Prime Minister of India, Indira Gandhi. On audio, Gyan Kedar talks to Dr. Sumin Patel. She's the co-founder of the Bombay Wala Historical Works. She talks about how she picks out the most interesting stories to showcase. And on Tere Mere Raaste, Kesha tells us the amazing transformation of the ravaged land of Purna Pani. Do follow us on social media. We're IVM Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Also, please do tell a friend. It really does help us when you spread the word about our podcast. And I'd also like to ask you if you could rate or recommend wherever you listen to our podcast. And speaking of where you listen to this show, if you're on an Android phone, do check out our new Android app. We have a brand new app with a brand new listening experience. Definitely check it out. I think you will enjoy it. And finally, we'd like to thank our sponsors this week, Bank of Baroda and Coin Switch Kuber. Thank you so much for making this possible. Welcome to the Filter Coffee Podcast, Ajit. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. I think uh, Mumbai is becoming a little more. You know, it's warming up a little bit. It's it's becoming a little. less unforgiving to those of us who are not really used to what is called the season of winter or cold you know so yeah it's it's just getting warmed up it's a, it's a bit of a nice little nip in the air and 
uh, I, I, perfect time for actually a coffee or a filter coffee, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm talking to you from Delhi, which is probably clocking eight, nine degrees. But on Twitter, I think Mumbai is stealing the thunder from Delhi on the Mumbai winter, quote unquote. Um, oh, absolutely. Our jackets come out at the slightest hint of uh, winter. So I don't think people understand what really a winter is, especially the kind that is in Delhi over here. Um, right. Yeah. Ajit, uh, thanks so much. I'm really, really looking forward to this conversation fundamentally because I think uh, your IMDb page is probably one of the most diverse that ever was, right? I mean, it's a genre defying sort of body of work, you know, which ranges from a Padmavat to an Andadun and, and, and to a Ray to just mix it up. Um, but, but before we go into that, uh, that entire journey, tell us a little bit about the young Ajit and what kind of dreams he went to school with. Where did he grow up? So look, I, I grew up in a little campus uh, in a place called Pilani, which is more famous for the famous bits, you know. Yes. But there is a little uh, institute campus there called Siri, which is a CSIR lab, you know, uh, Central Electronic Engineering Research Institute, where my dad was a scientist. So actually, I grew up with dreams which were completely different from what I chase today or what people call us dream makers or what have you. I wanted to be an inventor. So I was absolutely uh, taken in by uh, Edison and, you know, Vinci. And I was a person who was actually having some project going on in my garage. I was building stuff most of the time. And uh, I actually wanted to build a robot with vision. So something which will see an obstacle and which will turn using an LDR, light dependent resistance resistor and all of that. So a lot of childhood was uh, actually pursuing these backyard projects. I was a lot into coding. We were doing a lot of stuff on coding at that particular time. And of course, uh, you know, that whole uh, environment always placed some emphasis on academics and, you know, just making sure your school is going well and, you know, you're getting your, your whatever top tier marks and so on and so forth. Yeah. And of course, on the side, uh, you know, theater and whatever else other was there. So in, in that sense, it was in some sense, a very novel and exciting childhood, but especially this whole gadget making and invention is something which is a big part of what I wanted to do when I was a young child. And that uh, somewhere, I guess, still sort of runs through what I'm trying to do right now. I may not be inventing gadgets, but then I'm spinning stories <laughs> with, with the help of so many other storytellers. Yeah, so I think life started in a very different lane and um, it's in a very, very different space right now. I guess, yeah. So because I wanted to be an inventor and that took it very seriously. So it was a bit of a rancho kind of a life. So I learned that you must go to a crack engineering college. I was growing up next to one, which is Bits Pilani. So I wanted to go to either of the IITs or RACs and what have you. And I ended up uh, going to actually RAC Rorkila to pursue mechanical engineering, you know. And I had my rancho moments there where I said, well, they don't teach you how to invent stuff at all in these places. They want you to continue to <laughs> crack exams and, you know, run these papers and whatnot. And I tried a lot to sort of argue with professors and colleagues that we should be spending time on problem solving. We should build gadgets. We should probably co collaborate with Rorkila Steel Plant and, you know, understand what their problems are. And we are engineering students. We should give them solutions. <laughs> So people used to give <laughs> me dirty looks. <laughs> so I, I hugely relate to what uh, Chetan wrote and what became uh, became Three Idiots. Mm. Uh, so it was a it was a bit of a realignment that well, uh, you know, the system which actually takes you to the place you want to be requires very different things of you. While you may have a curiosity uh, which is dr driven very differently. So uh, there was some sort of a realignment I had to do and. Uh, and in, and in that whole process, I was getting a little disillusioned. And then my grades started, uh, you know, wobbling. And uh, of course, first, first time out of home and into a college. So, you know, all sorts of difficulties. You get your jaundice. Uh, you, you, you can't take uh, your bath in that brown water, which comes out of the tap. And, you know, that whole growing up as, as for the first time you make peace with hostel life happened. And I, and, and I gave up building any gadget and I said, let me first build my grades. And I ended up then focusing for the next few semesters and making sure that, you know, professors know that, okay, there is a decent bloke out here and I get my grades right. So went to engineering, finished that. And Hindustan Lever actually uh, was the day one company there. And mm -hmm. I ended up actually joining HUL, uh, which is what it used to be at that time, Hindustan Lever at that, uh, that point in time. And started off my engineering career in a FMCG company. So, <laughs> so all sorts of mismatches. 
but i really truly enjoyed that uh, entire stint there because uh, i got to do a lot of problem solving you know mm. and uh, what i wanted to actually do which is build gadgets build solution is something that actually i could do when i was the engineering manager with with unilever setting up plans you know creating solutions for the business which are uh, which are the big problems so the big excited me always give me a big problem if you tell me to you know improve efficiency it gets i, I get absolutely bored with it i remember in one of the factories where i was doing training they said that you must find ways of cutting the tea packaging loss by 5% i said oh god <laughs> please find someone else if you want to redesign this machine i am interested so i again got those strange looks but i enjoyed a lot that whole phase of learning because unilever is a great place to pick up stuff you're surrounded by these bright brilliant people who go to all sorts of institutes so i ended up actually after running a lot of uh, different uh, roles i ended up being in the in a very different business which they had called the animal feeds business so i was actually manufacturing animal feeds which is poultry feed cattle feed aqua feed and all those kind of weird things which people don't associate with hindustan lever and i was running this business at the age of what 24 odd without uh, any management experience other than of course the wonderful schooling of uh, hindustan lever and that's when i sort of reassessed and i said look all these blokes around me they are all actually have gone to these iims and here i am running a business and maybe it's 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 time for me to also you know make sure that you know i i i do have an mba and that quest took me to actually isb so i was with unilever pre isb and then post the indian school of business i came back to to mothership unilever and that's the only company i worked for prior to embarking on the journey in media which is 12 odd years with unilever across functions roles countries and uh, tons of uh, very interesting and inspiring people you know whenever i meet someone who spent considerable amount of time at hindustan unilever that is they always talk about it not just as a job but as a life changing experience right uh, one that helps them understand this country like no other university can talk to us a little bit about your time there i mean in the sense you know besides fixing uh, tea packing machines how did it help you understand the taste of this country and in a way prepare you for the second innings of your career so to say no one of the things i took away was that while i enjoy problem solving and uh, a large part of problem solving is about being able to define what do you want and where do you want to get to uh, this is something that you do across functions whether you are in manufacturing or you are in marketing with a lot of other partners you know and i always felt that look what they are getting to do is the more interesting thing so while i am telling them what kind of plant design i want and i am involved in laying down the specs and the broader design but they get to actually design the real plant similarly when i went to marketing i thought we we issue the brief but it's the is the creative director who actually gets to write the script so i was always envious about this other guy who's getting the juicier part of the fruit while i am sort of i always felt i am being the shell here you know so i think to me what was phenomenal about working with levers both in the first engineering function and later marketing and sales was this whole sort of juxtaposition of your clarity as to where you want to get to and then roping in you know people with completely different skill sets to try and get there i'll give you an example so for instance we were doing something for wheel where we wanted to actually connect with the low income housewife and uh, what we found is that for for the low budget laundry powder that wheel was there is only one way if if, if you want to connect with that low income housewife which is you try and understand her world better world better and try and see if you can get some insights and we found that you know this woman is something uh, who nobody cares about she has a thankless job and what she really craves for is appreciation by husband and uh, so from there by and by one ended up saying that look if i can construct an engagement activity where i can talk to her in her own world of this whole household world where she is a big problem solver does so many smart things and end up appreciating her you know through her husband then it will be a great way to get her attention that led to wheel smart shrimati which was uh, you know an idea to engage with the low income laundry consumer which eventually led me to conceive this whole game show that we came up with which actually was done with uh, with group m and ravina raj kohli was was part of that uh, entire adventure with me and and i remember how we turned the metaphor where we said that if if you wish to lost you know or sort of gambled away you know the dropadi in that so in our game show we had put the husbands in the center of the chaucer and the women who are playing the game show with their smartness they are answering every question the husband gets to move out of the chakra view one step by one step so the whole idea of you know taking the insight of this smart shrimati converting it in the form of 
a game show which was actually a replicable scalable way to take this entire mode of engagement with the consumers we actually did a massive program and anu kapoor was the anchor and it became uh, very successful much much more successful than what we had imagined perhaps and i remember the tremendous amount of partnership i used to I, and particularly with with mindshare and group i remember because all these guys used to come back with a response on what is the brief that one wants to you know give them and then you would ideate together and you would then create a solution which could be out of the box as this this ended up becoming a in fact that's responsible for what i do today and that's the first time i actually ventured onto a set which was practically conceived between me and ravina in a room on a white board that the set will mimic the chaucer and that was the first time i stepped into a pcr and i don't know i thought that you know this world looks interesting and uh, i intuitively connect with it and uh, and there is just so much fun there so i think it was this whole journey of you know kind of collaborating with a lot of people who bring in some unique uh, skills i still remember when we did a campaign called uh, pilavati versus vilavati you know which is we created two character one woman who is nirma pilavati and vilavati the one who uses wheel we actually wrote a nukkad natak of sorts and then the first time we recorded it that whole experience of what you have envisioned and written down as let's say maybe prose has now become a sort of song which a folk singer will sing you know and that whole recording and all of that so i think this whole process of an idea or a concept which sort of emanates somewhere and then when you collaborate with artists or experts who bring in their own layers of craft on it and then you you know come out as at, at, at an output i thought that was uh, fundamentally what i enjoyed a lot although i always felt that yeah this expert is having more fun the guy who's actually doing this bit <laughs> so i guess it was a bit of a choreography of ideas if you could say that with a lot of bunch of people and that led to some very fascinating outcomes you know and and i used to hear this every day that you should do you you are in the wrong job boss you should do something creative you should do something creative <laughs> so i guess i decided one day that okay let's take this advice seriously <laughs> and i had a bar on a different path but i think that was the that was the experience uh, you know outside of of course a whole lot of business things and a lot of leadership aspects and people skills and all i'm talking about the one which is more around the, the sort of creative shaping of ideas you know i mean it's small things i remember there was a sales program where the idea was that there are two philosophies of sales one is push led where the guy uses basically he just puts stocks into the dealers and then there is this other guy who actually is trying to improve the offtake you know and he uses a lot more brain rather than simply thumping the stocks onto the retail shelf so i remember coming up with these two concepts one is balbir the other is birbal so we said you know you are all you know so how do you make up from a journey from a balbir to a birbal you know i mean I mean, it's a small thing, but it just connected with people, and everybody wanted to be beerable, you know, and focus on secondaries rather than focus on primaries. So, I don't. Know, I've always found this idea of being able to take conceptually something, and how do you then sort of dramatize it so that it has a strong uptake with the consumer? A, a very exciting proposition, and I think that's at the heart of storytelling. You know, you have some something to say, but how do you say it so that it lands and and creates that response? I think that has. always attracted me yeah and i think that's been at the heart of a lot of stuff that happened back then in hu so i think i like how you always been chasing the guy who's having most fun and then wanting to be that guy and then sort of going ahead into the next chapter of your career but uh, yes. you know from, from from wanting to be you know in the space of bringing an idea to life to you know actually being a part of the industry that does yeah. how did that transition happen for you so it was over a period of time it was coming to terms with yourself so to speak i think i started realizing that what is giving me the, the most joy so of course the business challenges were were also very exciting to solve so were the leadership challenges but i always found that i felt the most satisfied when i was able to actually come up with an answer to a creative challenge and that started becoming more and more uh, clear to me and as i moved to uh, unilever in thailand on a regional activation job which was in hair care there was a bit of change of uh, let's say environment of moving from one country one environment from hul to unilever and any such transition gives you some kind of a time to introspect that what is it that you really want you know and um, i think at that time i had to make a call that either i pursue my career which is looking great and it's a fabulous company and you know you 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 can spend a lifetime or two in in places like unilever or 
or other such companies, or I sort of decide and face myself that what is it that I would really want. So I had to take the courage of taking my career lens out because the career lens said, you're in a great place, bloke, you're doing well (laughs) and you must continue this. But my life lens was telling me that this is great, but this is not only this can't be life and I want more out of life. So I think it was that key of taking off the career lens and putting on the life lens. And I said, even if things go wrong, I have sort of done things for long enough to be able to find some kind of way back to be able to, you know, uh, get back to pay my bills. But if I don't make this leap right now, then it might become very hard later. So I was 35. I mean, I was already 35 by then. You know? So when I ventured on the entrepreneurial journey and decided to set up a content company, because by that time on the sides, after Real Smart Srimati, I had started learning more and more about media. So I used to maintain my folders in the computer and, you know, do my own learning and assessment as to how things work. I found Balaji a very interesting company. I found Endemol and Fremantle. I was very excited. I said, look, their products are ideas. While my products are shampoos and soaps, they are dealing in ideas. And isn't that fascinating? You sell ideas. You know, we we almost sort of have to take the excuse of uh, advertising and an emotional route to sell our wares. Uh, how fun it would be if your product itself is actually an emotional product, which is a story. And uh, the idea of, you know, formats traveling across the world uh, was very exciting. And I thought that in in India, there was an opportunity where uh, formats don't come out of India. A lot of content at scale was not happening out of India. People were operating in small niches. There would be somebody who would be only doing fiction. Someone would only do formats. So I thought there was a play there. And I started constructing a business plan, you know. So I think it was drawing from all these, uh, let's say, parts, which are you. So you pick on your entire MBA and your management experience, and you try and use that discipline to develop a business plan, you know, and say, okay, what, what, what do this, what does this mean? What kind of capital raise I need? What, what are the kind of operational expenses in a, in a boutique company like this? What would it take to make this boutique into a, a larger scale? And all of that. And then I started meeting up people through various people who would help consultants in media, you know, And that was the exciting time in media because there was so much happening in the TV space, especially. And Ronnie was doing something exciting. Raghav was a a big name. And uh, I ended up having the good fortune of meeting some of these people. And that's when the journey started with a conversation with Raghav, where he was keen to start something and to back someone who would actually start uh, a content company. He himself had actually come from the content background in his own days before he had become, of course, a successful broadcasting entrepreneur. And it was exciting that if, if, if Raghav is ready to back you and, uh, you know, you want to launch a creative enterprise, uh, you won't look uh, much further. And I think that, that's where I thought that, okay, it's time I should, you know, take this punt and really take that serious call of changing the lane. Because I was very clear that this is not a shift or a job shift or a career shift or working from a company to A to B and all of that. I'd, I'd done that to a fair degree within Unilever. This was really a change of a vocation, so to speak, because I'm going to do something which actually I have really no, possibly no on-ground experience of, you know, because I hadn't done media in that sense. But by that time, I think there was enough thinking that had gone into it. Uh, I think the necessary pieces of the puzzle were there. The funding was looking, there was a path to funding. There was a path to scale up. There was enough excitement in the environment. A lot of expansion was happening in the broadcast space. So I thought that, okay, I mean, that was more than good enough to take a take a call and shift lane. And that's when I abandoned my sophisticated Boeing 747 or Airbus 320, what you have, which is the Unilever juggernaut and decided to fly my own little glider in Mumbai and started Colosseum. Yeah. You know, I, it's amazing. Um, you make it all sound so simple. I'm, I'm just putting myself in those shoes. I think what, 2007, 2008? Uh, yeah, so seven. That's right. Yes. Yeah, and uh, this is probably the the beginnings of probably three dot of of Indian television, right? Like, yes, absolutely. Doordarshan to then early satellite to then a completely different thing, and uh, you know, for someone who's not from that background, right, uh, to sort of uh, create something like that and then doing it at such a scale, right? I mean, setting up a company is one thing, but creating some of the the longest running and the biggest reality shows of this country, that would have been a, a phenomenal journey, isn't it? You know, there's so many threads to pick from that journey, but if you were to pick the, the most popular one, so to say, the, the whole roadies journey, how was that? 
Yeah, yeah. So actually, this connects back to to the first idea that I had developed the game show idea, and I'll, I'll quickly tell you how it was. So I had put together a bunch of these like-minded guys. Uh, Rajiv had joined. He was the first uh, person I had recruited. Rajiv Lakshman, who is Raghu's brother. Lalith had joined, and I had put together a core team. You know, the early excitement of a startup, and uh, we had funding. We had the team, and we were all uh, rolled up with our sleeves, and we were all ready to go. And this is where the rubber meets the road. Where where do you get your revenue from? So where is the first show that you will make? And that's where we were all looking at each other. That well, all the theorizing has been done. We are all here. Where's the first show? And uh, and I think I, I can imagine. I mean, Rajiv and, uh, and and all these people wondering that what will this guy do? You know, he's he's only done soaps of different kind. You know, in in his in his past life, and <laughs> how all of this is going to really work? Uh, and and I thought that uh, the best thing was that program, Wheel Smart Srimati, was so successful that even after many years I had passed out of that role and out of the country and out of the company, it was still running. You know, the subsequent people had actually kept it alive and. Uh, there was a pitch to produce that show so i went to my original uh, alba better and i stood in a line i said this is the show which i conceptualized many moons ago now i want to pitch for it i would want to produce it <laughs> so i went and pitched and uh, it was interesting sitting in the reception of the company you work for right and making a pitch and knowing that the culture that is in hul i am not going to get a single quarter <laughs> i will have to win my pitch and that was a very exciting chapter where i then sort of presented a road map uh, along with these partners who really uh, we said we have to make the best pitch of our life because this is really where either it all starts or you know or it doesn't and uh, that's the time we actually competed with i remember endemol bidtech including even showem because i think even showem was trying to do something so so there was a multi pronged competition and we said we have to do something which is bigger and more fundamental than all of these guys because they are of course going to uh, come up with the very very strong uh, pitches and that's when i sort of uh, dipped into what was the original idea and concept and how could this have longevity and how it could have scale and that pitch uh, along with my uh, founding team is the first show we ever did you know and uh, with that show being uh, commissioned to us and becoming our first revenue line uh, pressure immediately now mounted to my founding team that this bugger has done something which we had no clue of and it's time that because i said guys you are from media you know i am not from media i got the first show now show me what are you made of you know i'm sure you can do something and uh, of course uh, mtv was something which rajiv came from that background and that was the time we actually were working on an idea which actually was splits villa so rodies had already and it was actually original mtv property uh, so rodies was already being done by mtv and they said that guys can you apply reality to dating instead of to what they already do in rodies which is uh, you know daring the young people to you know to do all sorts of things that you do in that whole universe and that was our next big one so we came up with that idea i remember in that cubicle when uh, between me and rajiv we said we looked at each other i said shucks i don't know where is this going to lead us and indeed today if you see i think it's what eight seasons and uh, you know sunny leon i think is the anchor the last i looked at it and yeah. it's been a long journey you know so splits villa became the next one and then with the kind of success it had then we took over rodies and then we ended up shooting rodies almost in every we exhausted the whole continents as to where all rodies went you know it went to australia south africa i think china also was one of the places where we shot it so rodies took on its own journey splits villa became a sort of self sustaining universe so to speak and these are still big properties that power mtv you know yeah so i think yeah those were the early days of getting your first breakthrough in in a completely new world and uh, very exciting very thrilling and where we were egging each other on to you know to sort of be your best and you know get an outcome because your life depends on it you know <laughs> So I think that's how those 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 days turned. Yeah. yeah, you know, shows like these, right? They, they have an extraordinary connect with the core audience for them. Right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, I'm assuming at this part of your journey, there must have been a lot of things you must have learned about the the Indian audience, right? Not just the the Netflix wala audience, but the people who really add up the numbers in this amazing market of ours. Right? What are some of those lessons that probably changed your your original hypothesis of a particular trend or a situation were there any wow moments like that for you in this journey yeah so before i answer that actually what i should tell you is in unilever 
uh, and it doesn't occur to many people when you are actually selling FMCG goods, you are actually got a very good sense of what the country is because yeah. you travel down to places which most people never do regularly as a matter of practice. Uh, as a brand manager, as, as somebody running sales, you are on the streets. You are not in the cubicles. So you know the consumer firsthand. You are doing consumer home visits. So I knew the Indian housewife like the palm of my hand, you know, because of all that tons of work that I've done on Wheel or any other brand. And when I'm saying Indian housewife, I'm talking about the woman who is actually in Barabanki or in, you know, Jabua and, and places as low down as Popstata as that. So I think the point I'm making is that an FMCG brand consumer goods experience gives you a phenomenal glimpse into the real India that there is and not, let's say, a very small segment or a sliver of our society. And I think that itself was a huge head start because you already understand this consumer. In fact, what I had to do a lot of learning on was the MTV segment because I was tuned into the housewife. I was tuned into the middle class. I was tuned into the more universal segment of the society, so to speak. But I was not so tuned in on youth, you know. So that's where the new learnings came in and a lot of stuff which used to look very weird to me actually was insights that you discovered with youth that, you know, that youth is the age of weirdness, you know, uh, life finds some sort of a maturity or balance much later, but doing crazy stuff is the plan in, in that particular age group. And uh, when we did stuff like uh, roadies and splits villa, I mean, it was like an exposure to a completely new world because this world I did not know of, you know, that this is how young people react. And one of the things which I can tell you in my TV days, which used to keep coming back is uh, every time we made an assumption that Aisa thodi hota hai, you know, how can it be? Are there people like that? Every Correct. time the answer was, boss, Aisa hota hai. <laughs> there are people like that and not one or two, but tons out there, you know. So I remember when you're the minority, the, right? The, the guys in the marketing the cubicle are the minority. You yeah. don't know exactly that there is, this is a vast country and it's better not to build hypothesis and better to go and find out because otherwise you will make wrong conclusions. So when we did uh, MasterChef, you know, when we applied the science of reality to cooking, you know, which was again a first, we said, well, in India, I mean, women cook usually, isn't that? I mean, that's what is the, is the first top of, and where are we going to find that diversity, young people into cooking? And I'm talking about back then and not now. And we said, but will we find enough crew? What you see in MasterChef Australia, we had studied the formats. How will we get these kind of contestants? <laughs> we were so wrong. We just had to do the auditions, you know. I've built shows on magic, on stunt. And every time, you know, you say, okay, but will there be people like this? You know, or will people share these things on TV? Will people do these things on TV? Every time... The answer was, boss, you don't know, you know, they will. So I think that was one sub consistent surprise that whenever we would come up with a new format and we would think that maybe it's ahead of its time or maybe it's a little not practical to execute, the learning was quite the opposite, you know. And I think therefore it helped a lot to have that nimble setup of a small boutique company which can quickly, you know, do a recce and get an actual sense of the ground and get a quick sort of uh, a quick and dirty plan on what does actual ground reality look like. And that repeatedly used to come in all concepts that we, uh, you know, used to churn out and produce, whether they were original concepts or they were format. So, I mean, uh, it's a very cliched line, but the fact is stranger than fiction is actually what you encounter when you make fiction or you make fact, which is nonfiction. It's absolutely true. You know, you may not know it, but it all exists. You know, what fascinates me, Ajit, in your journey is not only the range of work, you know, you've done at Colosseum, where you produced content like Splits Villa or MasterChef or Rodis, like you mentioned, but also the, the conviction with which you would go on to greenlight fictional series and movies, you know, in your time at Viacom, content like Jamtara, Nandadun, and much, much more. I'm curious to understand how conviction works in your line of work, right? How you can see the kind of films and content, you know, these can become or say a toilet tech Prem Katha can become when there's still just words on paper. Yeah. So look, there are, there are two things from which conviction can come, which is one is of course your instinct, which I think is the first innate response to any story that you hear, you know, right. which is, does it draw you? Does it take you along? And so on and so forth. So I think that's a very intuitive response. Add to that, what uh, I have typically done is uh, I also see how are other people reacting to the same story? Because that is very illuminating. And one of the things that I 
do in the in the way script uh, assessment is done in the studio is uh, we have a fairly robust system where we actually record the response of a lot of people on that story or on the script you know and that is done incognito so for instance if you i have six people reacting to the story i made sure that each of them individually reacts to that story and and fills up their feedback without being in a room because i often found that you know if you're discussing within a room <laughs> everything boils down to let's say what is the highest paid guy who's you know his his opinion so i needed native opinion so i constructed and, and you know sorry to you, these are people from from your team or uh, outsiders No, no. Thing. So these are people who are, let's say, listening to a pitch, you know, right, uh, right. which is my team, and I don't want them to know my view. I want to hear their view because, to me, it's a, at a very simple level. It's actually simply uh, a referendum on on what this story or what this film will be. Because eventually, a film is a referendum. You may like it or not, because you put it out there in theater, and then people vote with their choices, like or not mm-hmm. like. So the idea was to sort of simulate a response early enough, and just to see, okay, what is my team saying, and what is the spread of opinion? And what I realized early on is that the two extremes are very easy to judge. So, for instance, if the story is terrible, you don't need to think much. <laughs> if the story is outstanding, equally, you 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 are very clear that you know you're getting a, a uniformity of response. Not only you are thinking it's outstanding, but ten other people think the same way. So it's actually uniformity of response, which is a very important currency. and the trouble one is the one where the opinion is divided you know and that sort of a story or a film will will struggle you know because it will find some people will go with that some people may not go with that and this is what is going to eventually happen at a large scale so this is my second mirror which gives me a sort of scope into what will be the response to this kind of material or story so between these two things which is my own instinctive feel about it and what is the response it i think puts at least me in a fairly good position to generate that conviction that should we do this or should we not you know and uh, that has actually uh, kept us in a good uh, place that has kept me honest because i'm always uh, conscious that in creativity there may not be right or wrong answers you know and it's not necessary that what i am saying is the only truth so i like to hear a, a lot of what the others are feeling as well and then take a third party view of it you know so i look at my own view also from a third lens as to you know what am i saying what is a b c and d saying and therefore what does it look like you know and i think that sort of a rigor is is something which has helped a lot and which has helped a lot even when we navigate stories which may look very different to the point that you are making that what is the similarity between and before we even you know talk films we also did jai shri krishna Uh, for colors we did bandan sar janmoga we did jamunia you know so what is the similarity between jamunia and splits villa you know absolutely nothing <laughs> you know but i think if you can look at content conceptually you know it is not that hard because it's about what is the response it draws from you what is the response it draws from the people who are the target you know so i often tell my team it's as simple as buying a gift for a friend because i think one common term i hear is people say i like it you know this is a common thing with in media i hear forget the consumer don't second guess the consumer do you like it tell me you know and because i like it i always believe the job is only half done when you say i like it or i don't because if you're buying a gift for someone which is a story that you're going to tell someone you need to know whether he likes that kind of a gift so if you got to buy a gift for someone you're not going to say that i'll buy what i like you know so of course you must like so that clears it to a certain level but what is he going to like and that's where this consumer mindset outside in mindset this is the who's going to listen to this story uh, is something which is crucial and you need to keep alive there so that's something which has been consistent and uh, to tell you about andadun for example andadun was a very interesting experience it was a fascinating script but it wasn't complete when shriram first narrated it we basically were at a point where we really did not know how this the last portion of the story the unraveling you know wasn't actually written by sri ram and the team but the film was such a pitch perfect thriller till that point that it was very clear that whoever is doing this irrespective of cast there is basic strength in the plot itself because the plot was every time ahead of where you were you are as an audience and i think this is something i always look for that is the plot ahead of the audience you know are you able to outsmart the audience or are you able to keep them guessing that's why i did drishyam i call drishyam the engineer's film you know because till the last scene you know you don't know and the last scene will tell you 
so i am someone who is a very plot driven guy i feel safe in the hard wiring of a plot because i know i have got tricks up my sleeve that is what andadon was doing as well you know it had a fand fascinating plot drishyam had a fascinating plot so i look for plot i know that writing itself is offering me so much of structure and so much of intrigue that whatever other layers of craft come on it this will not get ruined now the other layers can only improve it and that's what eventually shri ram did the kind of uh, portrayal that he created the kind of world that he created on top of that uh, on top of that very very taut thriller took andadun to a new level i still remember when i first saw the piano sequence the piano sequence is a very serious sequence because this guy is seeing for the first time the murder has happened and uh, he's playing the piano and of course what will you feel about it and then he witnesses the body being you know put inside the suitcase and then there is a thumb that hangs and all of that it was always a it was at a writing level a dark compelling sequence but when shriram treated it in a manner with, with the kind of you know bgm that you see and the kind of score that uh, the kind of piano that you you see and just the just the way he choreographed the whole thing it actually became comical you know and you were in a very different flavor and place of dark humor which is really his craft you know so i think a lot of this stuff comes as you go along when you add other layers of treatment of the director's craft the music the performances you know my gaze is very solidly on the harder parts because when i look at a story i am looking at at the table during a narration or a reading you know and if it is convincing me there then it can only improve assuming that you know the one who's going to shoot it and people are going to act in it will only sort of add further to it you know so so i think that's been one 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 consistent so you will typically see high concept stuff you know toilet for instance you know the whole idea of a man building toilet for the love of his life is is so damn compelling you know so i was after this script for the longest time because i thought this this concept itself is you know is worth the journey you know and this yeah. was actually sitting with another star at that point in time and then he couldn't muster up the courage because you know how can there be a film on toilet and so on and so forth then of course akshay came along that was the other instance where you latch on to a certain piece which is your conviction that you know this story has to be told because there has got a very strong central core in it so i look for the core and if there is enough in the core to convince me then you are into that relationship you know mm. that was fascinating you know i love listening to what you had to mm. say about uh, antardun because when when i saw i think it's a french short film or something which is like oh yeah yeah yes but it, it's not this film at all it just no, the no. piano sequence in a very very different so the sequence that i talk, mm. talk, talked about is actually the short film it's inspired from that right. but yeah, of yeah. course the whole construction and the whole organ mafia and what not i mean it was <laughs> it was it was a great experience to work with yeah. with this gentleman and create andadun and you know it was fascinating Ajit, I think we are we're probably going through a great passage in time, right? Especially for a for a company like Ycom, where it is an interplay between both content and platform, right? You're not only creating content for your own platform, Woot, but also for the Netflixes of the world. So, what I'm curious to understand is, uh, you know, from your vantage point, tell us what are the things that are changing rapidly in the content ecosystem. So, look, what happens is that. storytelling especially in films especially when films used to be only single screen or distributed largely as a single story which the whole world is watching actually it was a very limiting world hmm. because you have to look at a very wide demographic wide set of consumer and there is only one story that you have to tell so everything is going to be dumped down you know or everything is going to be simplified is a far better word and that immediately put several tons of restrictions on the storyteller so i think this is the fundamental change that is happening as distribution of storytelling has become completely atomized or digitized you know so the moment you had multiplexes which was one big change instead of that one single film there could be multiple films and that's where the freedom to tell those multiple stories came and we latched on to that because early when we did tanu wed's manu or we did kahani these are not your conventional stories even oh my god special chabbis you know yeah these are not what a typical or classical the lahori punjabi tradition of hindi cinema making of the johars and uh, you know yash raj and all of that no this is not so this was possible or made possible because distribution opened up so that was distribution opening up 1.0 you still are talking to the audience which has to come to theaters and to get audience to theaters and to pay which means you got casting constraints because you know if you and i are doing 
you know roles in that film maybe nobody will show up so you at least need to mount the film on recognizable and big cast and i think that is the other big shift that happened the moment ott came along you know it is like as if storytelling has been unchained you know now i don't need to worry about the uptake of the story because you know now the market has got million little segments you know because this is video on demand and i think this is really the big change that has happened in storytelling which is the most exciting that can happen if if you're a creative person because now you can tell stories which even if it's a small niche but which gives tremendous amount of love or connect to that story that's also success you know so success is not that you need to connect with everyone like in a theatrical you know you don't be need to be universally liked or appreciated or you need to get majority votes as we were talking in referendum terms you know now even if you can find a small cohort which watches that you know i mean rodies or splits villa was in some sense a cohort or a sub segment which used to love and connect that kind of a programming you know similarly i mean a, a bandhan sat janmok or a jay shri krishna it's a segment which connects so now imagine you are opening all these segments up that's what is happening and that's why we are able to do what we are doing so when we did jamtara you know i mean these are all new faces and i was so clear i said let's just go with i don't want any single recognizable face because we are completely having no need this, this is not going to go in theaters so it does not have the burden of pulling audience you know this is reaching it is a distributed content so that freedom of casting is a big relief now you can go to people who can act you are really building characters the other thing is when you you move to a long format or a series you don't need to uh, comply to the syntax of film storytelling which is a very hard bound syntax you know you what is yeah. a screen screenplay 75 80 scenes now imagine to a storyteller you say you can only tell a story which has 70 to 80 scenes huge huge constraint you know which is what makes screenplay so tough right so in series you where you can have got multiple characters you can each have their graphs you can have their back stories it just opens up the can so much i mean look at a money heist you know you are showing each character and his back story and then you are segueing back into the main story so the it's like playing an orchestra you know instead of playing let's say a solo vocal that you were playing earlier you know and there is just so much you can do so i think with that explosion of the possibilities of storytelling there is no limitation and that's why we are going into areas where we have not gone before i mean look at uh, she that we did for netflix it's a sort of psychological yeah. thriller which is a very <laughs> you know which is a very unique story a very weird story at, at one level you know who would think of a story like that if you were to make a film you know so i think this ability to be able to free yourself from the need of being universal is the best gift you can give to a storyteller because he is now free to exercise his creativity go in any direction channel his energies pick up something which is unpickable in the world of let's say a film format or so on and so forth so i think this is how the eco- ecosystem will evolve you'll get new makers you have democratized access to talent in terms of making talent or or actors and so on and so forth and look what is getting created you know you are seeing and the same thing what i was talking in tv terms that it's a vast country there is tons of talent out there you know you just need to democratize and create more access to this talent this is something that i learned while i did a lot of reality show now the same thing is happening in ott you are simply creating access i mean look at the shark tank version that you are seeing of uh, uh, the hindi shark tank version which is i think playing on sony live yeah, i'm not yeah, wrong you know yeah. look at the entrepreneurship stories which are coming from back and beyond you know so i think it's a fascinating country with such diversity that the only way the storytelling can be thriving in this country is by embracing that diversity you know look at regional cinema look at malayalam stories i mean they are fascinating they are so miles ahead in terms of the complexity that they deal with look at marathi films bangla films now all this was not known to a hindi audience today because of ott all of that is sitting in one platform and you can sample all those stories so it simply exposes you to so much of supply as consumer and as as a maker it it, it actually equally creates so many opportunities to finding small sub segments you know which will which will uh, connect to that story yeah. it's the best yeah. thing that can happen you know it's it's as if all the limitations were suddenly taken away yeah yeah you know for me i think uh, the biggest change today is that the money heist like you mentioned jamtara or adrishyam they are all sitting right next to each other on the same screen for the user right uh, i think that has empowered regional content creators especially in india probably like never before isn't it in this light tell us a little bit about the birth of something like uh, a tipping point 
right? which is uh, for the uninitiated, this is the digital content brand, you know, that you would create as a separate part of Ycom, which is, of course, also the arm that will go on to create content like Jamtara and She for Netflix. So look, tipping point was simply the expression of angst of a storyteller who's restricted. <laughs> because, you know, when you have to make cinema, actually, to, uh, contrary to what people think, it is actually a very restricting medium in many ways, especially if you're accountable for its commercial outcomes. Right. Uh, so then you your stories have to pass through three or four threads, you know, and only if they can pass through those three or four threads, you will eventually make the film. So there used to be so many rejections and so much love lawn rejection where you are in love with the story, but you can't tell it because it's not feasible. So I was actually collecting a bunch of material, which I could do nothing with. And that's when I thought that why don't I start this particular brand and this particular, you know, sort of label where we will have the opportunity to be able to tell these stories, which the other platforms don't allow or conventional platforms don't allow, you know, and that's how the whole tipping that the whole thought of tipping points started from there. And that segues beautifully with what the OTTs are doing, you know, because that we just spoke about gives you the, takes the, those filters away and you can tell mirrored stories. So it is a bit of a, it is, as I said, it was a bit of an angst uh, of not being able to do the kind of stuff that you wanted to do, which, which became the founding fuel for, for tipping point. And that's why you see the kind of stories that we've, we've, we've done there are, their grammar is very different from what you will see very in different. conventional yeah. cinema, or in some sense, you could say they are more like unconventional films, you know, which you could call, you know, maybe digital films or, so the idea was that bring in our film scale storytelling, the same canvas, the same kind of sophistication, you know, but with the freedom of going into new directions and new areas. And uh, that's what led to the birth of Tipping Point. It was also well-timed because that is when the OTTs were coming in and uh, there was in that sense that license to kill and you could, you could go and hunt, you know, new stories, come up with new material and, uh, and that, that's how that journey has begun, you know. Uh, coming to the regional part, look, I've always been fascinated by regional cinema and uh, uh, we, have, we have such diversity. So if you mm. see Bangla, Malayalam and Marathi, they offer create material uh, f- from a storytelling point of view, you know, sophisticated stories, nuanced stories, and they are free of stardom, you know, because in these markets, people respond to plain stories as well. There's no burden of stardom. Yeah. Then there are, of course, the other end, which is the Telugu cinema, the Tamil cinema, which takes stardom, uh, holds it with its hand and, you know, hurls it across the country and, you know, comes with the colossal like a Pushpa or a Bahubali. So you see, you have this entire spectrum to choose from. So I've been along with my team very avidly watching a lot of regional cinema. And uh, in fact, that's where Drisham came out of. You know, when we saw that film, we said, this is such a fascinating, uh, you know, material. And this this will succeed in any language that it is made, you know. Same thing. So I think our hunt for different material has taken us in different places to new talent, to regional cinema. And uh, we've always looked for remake material or material that we could adapt, you know. We've also done stuff where uh, scripts that have originated in Hindi and they were unviable or did not go forward in India, ended up being films in South, you know. So there is a film called Tambi that we did with Karthi uh, last year, which actually is one such project, which we started off as a Hindi film, but it ended up becoming a Telugu feature. So I think regional has been an integral part of our thinking. We are big fans of regional cinema. I mean, Super Deluxe, for instance, still almost leaves me awed in terms yeah. of the kind of imagination that exists in especially you know, Southern cinema. And it pushes you to really you know, open your own boundaries and limitations that you exist and, you know, you think uh, you are, you're, you're functioning in. And it's a great source of inspiration, you know, and, and I think uh, we've, we've used a lot of that material and we'll continue to engage in that. And you're seeing what is happening now. Regional is becoming national. So Pushpa can come and rule over the country because it is actually the missing Hindi film, which Hindi industry is no longer making, you know, the 80s Bachchan and the big single screen film, which, which, is become extinct from this modern multiplex yeah. storytelling that we have gotten into. And know? it doesn't matter that it was not made in Hindi, right? Like you, you're able to enjoy it today. Right? Yeah. Absolutely. Because it's, it's grammar is actually the good old Salim Javed cinema of, you know, the Bachchan era and so to speak, the heroism of this guy who belongs in those, you know, coal mines or those masses and, and, and the craft, you know, I mean, look at the dances. I mean, Ganesh has choreographed all those dances. So even when we say films from South, films from... Uh, Bollywood, these are all labels. Ultimately, a lot of technicians work across industry. Yeah. And the basic mm-hmm. ability, uh, look at you know music directors, you know, uh, they work across both the places. Uh, so I think we have a, we've, we've got a phenomenal palette to choose from, 
and we are only limited by our own uh, ability to what can you do with so much you know right yeah we are only limited by our own imagination <laughs> Beautiful. We usually end the episode by asking our guest who, what he or she is watching, reading or listening to. I think the answer to your question should be an episode by itself. But from everything that you've seen, you know, in the last uh, few months, anything specific that stands out for you that you would love to recommend? Look, uh, I loved uh, this film, uh, which I watched, I think just a couple of days ago, which is the uh, Sham Singha Roy. You uh-huh. know, I mean, that way it is a cliched reincarnation idea. But the way it's been presented, I absolutely loved it. You know, I don't know how many people are talking about it, how much it has been noticed. But for a Telugu film to go into a character who's actually a Bangla character and go into the violence of Calcutta and present it as a epic love story across, you know, two eras, I, I was I was quite impressed by it. The other one is, which has recently moved me a lot is uh, is the Phantom Thread. You know, Daniel Day Lewis. Oh yeah. Oh. And and uh, that is something that and so I like to watch stuff which kind of challenges uh, our own sensibilities. You know uh, uh, that, that 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 this too is a way of doing cinema. You know, <laughs> so it it just makes you sort of question your own formulation, your own world. You know, and uh, so I think I mean what comes to top. And you're right. I mean it's a very long conversation, but I think top of my mind these two are the names which are just popping in my head right now. Wonderful. Ajit, thank you so much. It's an exhilarating conversation and uh, wishing you all the luck with all the projects in your pipeline and I hope to speak to you very soon again on the show. Certainly, Karthik. I don't know where the time went. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize it's been an hour or so. <laughs> so, yes. And um, yeah. uh, thanks a lot for having me over. I, I really had a lot of fun and um, look forward to more of this. Absolutely. You know, nothing yes. like a free-flowing chat on content and stories and cinema. <laughs> there is no end to it. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you. So that was our show this week. I hope you liked it. And if you did, and if you're a fan of the show, hey, I have something to ask of you. If you are listening to the show on Spotify or Apple right now, please do rate us on the respective app. It helps a lot in others discovering the show. And if you have any feedback on the show, I would love to hear from you. You can send it to filtercoffeepodcast at gmail.com. Happy listening and see you next week with another episode. Don't you think that if everyone around you is getting smart, you better be smarter? Hey there, I'm the traveling professor Siddharth Deshmukh and I'm back with season 2 of my podcast to make you smarter. Smarter with Sid. What's this season's focus about? Well, it's about 10 minute nuggets that will make you stand out at work. It's time to go from smart to smarter. Tune in every Tuesday and Thursday and become smarter with Sid. Safar रास्ते मंजिल और मुकाम अक्सर ये हमसे कुछ कहना चाहते हैं पर हम हैं कि अपनी रोजमर्रा की जिंदगी में इन्हें सुनने से कतराते हैं नमस्ते दोस्तों मेरा नाम है केशव चतुर्वेदी और मैं आपको ले चलूंगा कुछ ऐसे सफर पर जहां आपको एक नया नजरिया मिलेगा सफर और मंजिलों को देखने का आइए इन किस्से कहानियों में डूब जाएं हर मंगलवार और शुक्रवार 